again, everybody, and welcome to the Marquette Hoops Basketball Show. My name is Tom Pippins, and I am blessed today to be with my good friend John Dodds and also our marvelous producer, Jason Ruck. And today we're going to dedicate this show to a Marquette legend who sadly passed away recently at the age of 74, George Thompson. And to talk more about the man George Thompson was, not just the brute force on the basketball court, we have John Sheely with us. He is the former chairman and CEO of Briggs & Stratton, worked together with George for some three decades. So we'll get to that very shortly. And John, first of all, thanks for being here. To oh, you're your welcome. Insight. It's great. Yeah, about George the man. How about George the player, J.D.? I mean, many people have compared. It might have been our good friend Homer, too, who worked with him on the radio for all those years, said he was Dwayne Wade before Dwayne Wade. If you look at market basketball and you want to look at a Mount Rushmore of players, and uh, you'd have to say Don Coaches, George Thompson, Butch Lee, who was the player of the year in 1978 in college basketball, and Dwayne Wade, obviously. George Thompson termed Dwayne Wade the best player ever at Marquette. And I would add a, probably a fifth-faced Bo Ellis. Mm -hmm. Bo Ellis uh, was in two championship games in 74 and 77, and what he's done with the community uh, in Milwaukee and the Marquette community since. But uh, George Thompson, there's only one George, and whenever you talk to uh, Al McGuire, or Rick Majerus or Hank Raymond's back in the day, Al McGuire arrived when he was able to recruit George Thompson. He was the straw that stirred the drink. Mm -hmm. He was the brute force. He was 6'2", but he played 6'8". He had incredible he had incredible upper thighs like Eric Hyden or uh, Dylan of the Packers, and he could just sky. And he was from um, New York City. He went to uh, Erasmus uh, Hall High School. Um, where he uh, became a legend, a playground legend, and a legend. They were 22-0 and 0 and won the New York City Championship that year. And that was an era where you would get players like Connie Hawkins and Dr. J. And uh, George Thompson and Lou Cinder would come out of New York City. And basketball for the inner city playground player at that in that era wasn't just, I'm going to go down and play. It was a a mode of self-expression where you would go on the court and you'd put a little bit of flair, flamboyance, or as Al would say, French pastry mm. on on moves. And uh, we'll have some highlights during the show of, uh, of some of George's moves. Yeah, he was special. A reminder that this Marquette Hoops basketball show is brought to you by Moonlight Graham, the proud sponsor of this program, Moonlight Graham Modern Dental Benefits. George Thompson coming from the court to Briggs and Stratton, and obviously he was the face, as you said, uh, John Shealy, of the company from the perspective of community relations and what have you. He was always a joy to deal with. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. What kind of a person was George Thompson? We know all about, at least those of us blessed to be old enough to know of him on the court, but what, what was he like as an individual? George was a really good guy, and... Um... But he, had, he also had a t tremendous uh, sense of humor. I remember one time um, we had a conference, a distributor conference uh, in Africa. And so we're in the middle of Serengeti and, and we're on a safari. And there's a pair of uh, ostriches, what can I say, procreating. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Well and, said. And Very <laughs> graceful. <laughs> one of the the male ostrich gets up and runs away looking for another target, and to which George comments, and he didn't even call her a cab. <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was really uh, funny. He was the 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 most important thing about George is that within twenty minutes or 20 seconds, he could size up anybody. He could tell who's a good person, who's a bad person, who we should deal with and who, who we shouldn't. And he had an uncanny sense, and I, I think some of that came from having been from Brooklyn. I think if you don't have that, uh, Al McGuire had the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have that, maybe you don't survive Absolutely. very long in, in, uh, in Brooklyn. But uh, he was... He always had these, these great sayings where he could, he could distill anything down to a handful of words. Um, 
when things weren't going too well at Briggs, he'd say, give me another can of monkeys because these ones won't dance, <laughs> you know? And we, everybody knows about our, our union issues, but I would have to have an interview with a guy from the Journal Sentinel. And we go through this interview and we'd finish up and George said that was a real uh, intellectual tractor pull. <laughs> so, uh, and he, he had a name for everybody. He called me the professor because I, I taught law school um, part-time even while I was uh, CEO. And uh, he, uh, he called my wife Hedda, as in Hedda Hopper, because she wrote the, the society page for the Journal Sentinel. And he called my son Mini-Me. <laughs> well, we're in, we're in, in, you know, we were always searching for a name for, for George. So we're at the same governor's camp in Kenya, and we're having dinner under the tent. And the Mater D comes over and he says, you're Mr. George Thompson, aren't you? So we're halfway around the world. And here's the Mater D saying, George, well, his wife Karen, I thought she was gonna fall off the, <laughs> the chair. So anyway, after that, he became known as Global G. Uh, <laughs> That's to awesome. the, Brute Force and Global, Global G. Global G to the, to the rest of us. Brute Force just didn't seem to work in the corporate. <laughs> no. In the, in, the, in the corporate setting, but uh, the, apparently we had done this big conference in, in Africa and the newspaper had noted that George Thompson, former Marquette and NBA basketball player was there and the Mater D had read this and that's how he got it, but it, was, it came out of nowhere. Um, and it, as I said, uh, uh, Karen just couldn't believe it. Yeah, his beautiful wife. John Sheely is the former chairman and CEO of Briggs & Stratton. We're delighted to have him here on the Marquette Hoops Basketball Show with John Dodds. I'm Tom Pippins, and uh, we are brought to you by Moonlight Graham, the proud sponsor of this program, Moonlight Graham Modern Dental Benefits. It's as if he had a vision, it sounds like, John Sheely, in the corporate world. John, he certainly had vision as a player, didn't he? I mean, the ability to see things, and I know Homer talked about this, for many years again, the formidable team, that dynamic duo calling Marquette University basketball games, he saw plays happen before they happened, both as a player and an analyst. Yeah. I mean, one of the most important things he did at, at Briggs and Stratton is we, um, as I, I talked about our, our union issues, um, we kind of discovered at a point in time that we didn't have a lot of residual goodwill in the community. And we'd given away millions of dollars to local charities and really got, you know, little recognition for it. And so I sat down with George and I said, what, what are we going to do? And George developed what he called the three-legged stool, uh, which was a Summerfest, a mm -hmm. stage on Summerfest, uh, Al's Run, yeah. okay, and the Brewers Baseball. So George said, give me 400 grand of the money you'd otherwise give away uh, to these charities and and you know all of a sudden people will recognize who Briggs and Stratton was so we did all that stuff uh, probably the most fascinating was was uh, re-engineering um, Al's run which you were involved with uh, with Tom um, uh, George getting Al to re-engage himself in the in Al's run was 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 quite a chore because mm -hmm. uh, Al usually didn't do anything he didn't right. have to do. <laughs> <laughs> John, if I may, just a side story. I remember having the privilege of running in it with Allie McGuire, right, his son. And, you know, we came back in and his father said, where have you been? I've been here for about 10, 10 or 15 minutes. minutes. Yes, and he right. hardly ran at all. That was <laughs> part of the legend of Al McGuire. This is fascinating, though, isn't it, John Dodds, to, to hear the impact that George had. How about, is, we'll, we'll go back and forth with the hoops. Vision, it seems, uh, in business, vision on the court as a player and an analyst. What's your take on that? Well, as an analyst, Maybe it's because he was from Brooklyn, but I thought he had the identical personality of Al McGuire. Whenever I talked to Al <laughs> McGuire, Al McGuire was always sizing people up immediately. Al 
told me one time in an interview that uh, he, if you would drive a cab for six months and be a bartender, you could then go to college, then you'd really have education. And Al said, because Al could size people up as, as you said, from Brooklyn, he would size them up at the bar immediately, and so could George. But George and Al would also, uh, on broadcast, not tell you or explain what just happened. They had a feel in a, what's going to happen. You know, I think this is what's going to happen. And 90% of the time it would. And it was kind of a Nostradamus quality that they could go out and, and uh, yeah, that's... Uh, a couple of handsome guys. Yeah, George. <laughs> George and uh, uh, the Homer. Yeah, George. George quietly did so much for Marquette basketball uh, after he left. Uh, yes, he was at Briggs in the community, but I remember one story. And now the NCAA has changed the rules, so you cannot do this. But um, Kerry Trotter got up at a uh, banquet and started crying and getting very emotional at the podium saying that his best friend in life was Rick Majerus. He left Creighton Prep to come up to Milwaukee to be coached by assistant coach Rick Majerus. He said when Majerus became a head coach, the relationship changed because he couldn't be his friend anymore. Mm -hmm. He had to be kind of like the father figure mm -hmm. and dish out playing time. And uh, Trotter was having a difficult time dealing with that. And he was getting a little depressed about it. And so he called George Thompson and talked to him on the phone for about uh, 20 minutes, and George Thompson said, where are you? He said, I'm at my dorm. He said, you stay right there. I'll be there in 15 minutes. And on a Friday afternoon, he picks him up, takes him to his home. He stayed the weekend, and he said, they treated me like a member of the family, and that's exactly, he said, his wife Karen and their kids, that's exactly what I needed. I just needed to get away from the pressure-packed Marquette basketball scene. And I came back and it, it saved my career at Marquette because I was thinking of quitting. And I thought that's just a little thing that he would do and uh, it would not get recognized, but people in the know knew, saw him do that. Mm -hmm. Do your good deeds and don't let other people uh, know about them necessarily. That was a very humble man, was he not, John? Yeah, and, and um, 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 thankfully he married Karen because she kept him humble. <laughs> <laughs> or else. That's right. That's right. Uh, he, was, uh, he was an incredibly humble guy. He, a lot of people don't understand uh, w what an extraordinary person he was. Um, 25 years after he graduated, they had a 25th anniversary All-American basketball team. Uh, and they had a um, banquet in, in Atlanta to recognize these people. And it was uh, Jojo White. These were people who all graduated in, what, 69, 70? George Thompson? Yeah. 65. Yeah. Oh, 65. Yeah. Okay, in 65. Which is a shame, not to interrupt. Oh, you're talking about high school or you're talking no, about college? No, talking about college. Oh, college, 69. 69. 69. Yeah, 69. And it's a shame because, again, today for the younger people out there, just the greatness of this man. You've got video everywhere you turn, but it wasn't the case. But to your point about this awesome story, Jojo so the, White. So the five people on this team were Jojo White, um, great basketball player for the Celtics, yeah. uh, Mike Krzyzewski, yeah. uh, James Cash, who was a... Uh, Harvard professor, uh, Lou Alcindor, wow. now Kareem Jabbar, and George Thompson. Yeah. Hmm. And they were being recognized not just for what they achieved on the court, but for what they achieved on the court and off the court. And I think that was a recognition of, of all the things that, that George had done after he left basketball. That's fascinating. John, I know you have some wonderful stories relating to George. The respect that players who came well after him had for him. He, he commanded an audience, didn't he? I mean, just always reaching out. They knew who he was. His legend was kept alive, and rightfully so, by the Marquette University family. Sure. Jarrell McNeil, that picture right there, um, he was the first person to, uh, to break George Thompson's scoring record. And, and George was happy as heck just to give him props, and then later uh, Marcus Howard did. Now, both of those players had the advantage of playing four years with mm -hmm. the three-point line, three-point exactly. shot. So George, 
George, when he came to Marquette in uh, uh, 65, he uh, averaged 23.7 points a game on the freshman team. So he set the all-time record with 405 points. So they knew they had someone special. Then as a sophomore, he uh, averaged 18 a game and scored a then record 523 points as a sophomore. So um, Paul Zimmerman, who later became Dr. Z from uh, Sports Illustrated, right. Uh, said that um, instead of watching George Thompson, he has a pair of thighs that belong in the NFL <laughs> yeah. and the kind of chest that you see in health magazines. <laughs> and he, and then you Elmer, know he was drafted by the Colts. He was drafted by the, yeah, yeah, the Baltimore story. Colts. I yeah. did not. Yeah. Yeah. And the Boston Celtics, uh, when he left Marquette in 69, uh, he was a fifth-round pick, but he decided to go to the ABA, and he became one of their signature players and was a three-time All-Star with the Pittsburgh Pipers and the Memphis Tams. And uh, we found a video of uh, George playing in an NBA All-Star game, and there it is. He just was introduced. He's second in line there. And I think Dr. J makes a, uh, a steal or a block. They, they get it out. And Look George, at this move. There's, there's George there Thompson coming with up. <laughs> That's neat. Watch him, John Sheely, here, because yeah. John does able to secure this video thanks to our producer. So Dr. J blocks Ruff. the ball yeah. and he heads down. Now watch the, the flare that Ooh, George had. Do. Little, oh! That's, the, that's, <laughs> nice. that's George Thompson. <laughs> you didn't see a lot of that back then. You know? yeah. And he had records at Marquette that stood for four decades. And yet, as you say, John, when Jarrell broke the record, he couldn't have been happier. And when there came a time, was it after the Kentucky game, the year that Marquette went to the Final Four under Tom Green with D. Wade, who had that incredible triple-double, that he said to him, this is the man now. Yeah, you this, are the man. You are the all-time, not for a while. Coming from the man. Not only for what you've done at Marquette, but for what you're going to do. He said, you are the, the best. And uh, Homer relayed that story. That was... Uh, that was an interesting story there, but when uh, nobody got more emotional when Marquette beat Kentucky mm -hmm. than George Thompson, and when they beat Kentucky up in Minneapolis to go to the Final Four, right. that was the zenith in terms of George Thompson's broadcast career, and nobody was more happy for Marquette then, because um, George Thompson, uh, Kentucky meant something uh, in the 60s, and it meant um, Marquette embraced the uh, inner city uh, African-American ball player and Kentucky was late to the party with that so there was always something going on and Kentucky beat Marquette badly about 107 maybe 80 something in George's uh, junior year but George's senior year they played the NCAA tournament in Madison and they upset Kentucky in one of the, the great uh, and you see the picture of George he's flashing double peace signs at half court for victory. And while Al and Hank are, you know, Hank is doing this and Al's, you know, going on in the court, beating Kentucky was always the, the thing. And I remember as a nine-year-old watching uh, the next game, uh, Marquette lost to uh, Purdue on a last second shot by Rick Mound in overtime. And that kept Marquette from the final four. Um, and uh, uh, to this day, I don't think I've gotten over it. So, uh, but I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> yeah. try. And, and you know what? I've got some Kleenex here for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because Thank you. it's about John Dodds. I it is. I want everyone to know that, yeah. as it should be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a little verklempt <laughs> right now thinking about it. But, uh, yeah, George was very clear. And, and George, even back then, was saying that, yes, I set all these records, but in 1969, he said, there's a guy here, and he pointed to Dean Memminger. Mm. Dean Memminger is going to be breaking all of my records. Mm. And George was the – George – Al got George and that turned the faucet on from New York City right. because then Dean Memminger yes. came and then Butch Lee that came. Pipeline, right? The pipeline came in and that was an unbelievable pipeline that finally dried up about the time Al retired and the Big East started. Look at how high he is right there. It's just absolutely incredible. A foundational piece yeah. to the Marquette University basketball program. A legend, an incredible player, but John Sheely, as you've been saying, <laughs> The former chairman and CEO of Briggs and Stratton, we're so thankful again to have you with us. Your perspective. He was a he was an even better person. Yeah, you show that picture. I remember George saying once. He says, "I was six six with an afro." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Artis Gilmore, the, the good doctor, they, they all wore them in those days. Yeah. But George was a really important part of 
the turnaround that we were able to achieve uh, at Briggs and Stratton, and we became very successful. By the time George retired, I think he retired in 2007, 2008. Um, but George was, it was a place that I could go. If you're the CEO, people inevitably lie to you because they think you want to hear nothing but good stuff. But I could walk down the, the, the aisle and go into George's office for half an hour and I could find out what was really going on at Briggs and Stratton and that dramatically improved my decision making. And I think, I think all the stuff that we did to, to um, improve the profile of Briggs and Stratton in the community was, was very important, but George was invaluable as a, an advisor to me mm -hmm. uh, in making uh, difficult decisions in a difficult time for the company. Yeah. And you, of course, were talking major dollars and major people, uh, all your uh, decisions impacting so many in the company. I guess it speaks to a man, George Thompson, who was honest. Yep. And a, you know, a man of integrity, somebody you could trust. Yep. Yeah. One of my uh, vice presidents uh, sent me an email saying he was a really good guy. Yeah. And that kind of that kind of says it all. Yeah. 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 Steve, and you know, you don't if if you've had that kind of. Um, uh, success, particularly early in life, some people never get over that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're divas uh, mm -hmm. until the day they die. George um, was a was a, a quiet, um, as you said, humble person, who was just a really good human being who had in, incredibly incredible uh, people skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and Al McGuire always used to say, John, right, don't let basketball use you, you use basketball. And George Thompson did that to go on and have an amazing career away from the hardwood. Right. Yeah, he really did. In fact, uh, I took a page out of the 1967 Marquette Press Guide, and it said after his freshman year, it said, uh, it says George is a speech major at Marquette and is ready is a ready volunteer when McGuire calls for a player to talk to youth groups. Mm -hmm. So even then, as a 20 year old, he would go out and he had a story to tell, and he was a an academic star in high school uh, at Erasmus Hall. So it, he had the whole he had the whole package, and he uh, he was elected to the Wisconsin Hall of Fame in 2001. He was elected to the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame in 2013. He's a member of the Marquette Hall of Fame, and he was inducted into the Brooklyn, New York Hall of Fame in 2016, and that was the one Homer told the yes. story where Ple yeah. he Go went. Go ahead, yeah, share that. Yeah, go, yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. He, he was here with us. He just said that people came up to him and said, George, this should have been done years ago, and he was just a legend in, in, uh, in New York, and you see George Thompson, everybody knew uh, who you're talking about. John Sheely, you knew Al McGuire well. What was the relationship as you saw it between <laughs> George and Al? I, I think the funniest thing in the world w was sitting in the same room watching Al and George talk to each other. Because it, <laughs> it wasn't clear which one was scamming the other, <laughs> the other more. When, when we decided to, to kind of um, re-gear the um, Al's run and Briggs and Stratton became a sponsor. Um, we would have these uh, breakfast sessions with with Al, and Al would not want to meet at uh, the Milwaukee Club or the University Club or Blue Mound or anything like that. He wanted to meet at Wendy's or sure. at uh, sure. Burger King, <laughs> and so we'd go to Burger King, and we'd sit in a booth, and you know a bunch of people would obviously recognize Al and Al would say can you get me one of those donuts and and it, it the, the the breakfast at, at Burger King then was one of these glazed donuts that was <laughs> half liquid <laughs> and and I, I got it for Al and I said Al can I get you something better he said no that this will work fine um, the funny thing that day was um, 
Al's zipper was open. <laughs> okay. So I, I said, it Al, what? with it, age occasionally. I said, I said, Al, one of, one of our zippers is open. And, and I'm not going to say who it, I'm not going to say who it is, but, uh, George and, and, um, George and Al both were cut from the same cloth and, and to see the two of them interact was, was something to behold. Mm -hmm. John, I think he was a bit of a private person, was he not? He was. We were trying to get him on the show yeah. uh, over the last few months. Recently, and, yeah. Yeah, and uh, trying to get Homer and Bo Ellis to get him on, and he just uh, didn't want to do it. He was uh, just real quiet, and uh, he was approachable, though. I remember I was trying to prepare in 1999 when I first started my radio show on Saturday mornings, and I was going to interview Al McGuire. And I went up to George, and I said, George, I'm trying to interview Coach. Do you have any tips? And he goes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, Coach will never do anything <laughs> unless there's, he wants something. <laughs> and so if he's doing an interview with you, it means he wants you to do something, something for him. Yeah. And so uh, he said, I, I, he called me, he called me uh, a couple months ago. And he said, hey, George, Coach here. I said, how you doing, Coach? Great. Uh, Say, George, just calling in to find out how you're doing. Sure, and he goes, sure. He goes, uh, okay, coach, what Part do you want? It. What do you want? No, 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 coach. I or no, George. I, I don't want to. I don't want to say anything. I just want to find out how you were. I want to touch some of the old players that uh, were so important in my life. And he goes, well, thanks, coach, for calling. Now, what do you really want? And he goes, no, no, no. Well, George, now that you mention it, do you have one of those Briggs and Stratton snowblowers? Because I'd like to. <laughs> that maybe had to go through the boss. <laughs> oh, so? I think George had a uh, had that in his budget. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> the best picture I've ever seen of George Thompson was that picture that Mark had put on their website after uh, they announced that he had passed, where uh, he's on the court and he's giving directions to mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Butler. DJO, Vander Blue, and Jay Crowder. Uh, DJO and Vander had a cup of coffee in the NBA. The other two have probably made $150 million mm -hmm. in the NBA. But they're, they, the way they're looking at George, they know that you know, the Oracle is speaking. Well, this has been absolutely marvelous, John Dodds, as always, to be with you on the Marquette Hoops basketball show and to have you, John Shealy. I mean, you may, we wanted to dedicate this to a great player, but an even greater individual, as we've been saying, this, this program. And we can't thank you enough as the, the former uh, CEO, the, uh, the big cheese, the chairman as well, <laughs> at Briggs and Stratton. But they, you were successful as well. You're humble as well. And, and I know you and George made a, a terrific team. So thank you so much. Thank you. Really good to see you. Yeah. Well, for John Dodds, our special guest, John Sheely, our producer, Jason Ruck, I'm Tom Pippins. This has been the Marquette Hoops Basketball Show here on My24. We'll see you next Saturday morning. And as always, we're very grateful for you and we are grateful for our sponsor, Moonlight Graham, proud sponsor of the Marquette Hoops Basketball Show, Modern Dental Benefits, Moonlight Graham. Take care, everybody, and God bless. We'll see you next week.